looking at the conscience. Uh, two weeks ago, we looked at what the conscience is, just defining what the conscience is and what it's not. Uh, last week, we looked at how to adjust our conscience, how to calibrate our conscience, looking at the fact that sometimes our consciences are too overly sensitive. We kind of think that everything has sin behind it, and we're suspicious of people and suspicious of our own selves and self-condemning because our conscience constantly judges us and condemns us for every little tiny thing. And yet some of us, our, our consciences have been numbed a little bit, like we're giving sleeping pills to a watchdog. You know, we go and we go a little too far with sin, but we just kind of numb that and say, well, this is okay. And so we constantly are in this state where we have to be adjusting and calibrating our conscience, and most definitely and ideally uh, calibrating our conscience with God's Word, seeing what God's Word says about our oversensitivity or our, our numbness. And today we're going to be looking specifically at how do we live among and with and next to people who have differing consciences with us? And I know no one in this room has ever experienced anything like this, so this might be a completely irrelevant message. I'm sure everyone around you has an opinion that's exactly like yours on every matter, right? Probably not. There are no two consciences that are alike. Even for you who have a best friend or a spouse, you're sometimes perplexed and amazed that how can they have an opinion like that when this is clearly correct. I, I obviously know God's perfect will, and they clearly are not seeing it the way I'm seeing it because I'm seeing it the way God sees it. And you just wonder sometimes how people can have the opinions that they have. They're God-fearing people. They love Jesus. They love God's word. And yet you differ on things that are sometimes pretty important. And so today we have to figure out how are we going to live among each other. And the answer, just so you know, is not strong-arming them into seeing it your way. Uh, and that's really that's one of the constant uh, points of arguments and fights and marriages and friendships is when we have differing opinions and we're just setting out to win. We just want them to see our side and, and we're just going to be stubborn until we win and they see our side. But that clearly is not the solution. That's just impractical, unbiblical. Uh, we don't want to live that way. We want to learn how to coexist and live among people who have different opinions than us, different convictions, and their consciences are attenuated differently than ours. And yes, that sometimes means that someone maybe is clearly in sin and you're not, or maybe you are and they're not, but we're talking about just the, 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 the variety of different ways that our consciences differ, whether it's with other believers or with non-believers. Uh, whether it's really just opinions or if it's like there's actual factual scripture says this, we need to learn how to live among people who differ from us, believers and non-believers. And some of us, as I mentioned the last couple of weeks, some of us have a stronger conscience where we enjoy a lot of things that other people might think are sinful to enjoy. The, the Bible doesn't uh, say that we can't enjoy it, but someone says that, well, if you do this, it's a slippery slope or whatever it is. Some of us have a strong conscience where we can enjoy a lot of gifts of God. Others of us, we have a, a weaker conscience where we uh, look at something and we think that it's sinful. We think that it's wrong. We think that it's going against God's desire. So we're more easily wounded. We're more easily offended. And I've made the case the last couple of weeks that I think that all of us are a mix of these two. You might be a little more strong, maybe predominantly, but chances are there are areas in your life where you're very strong in your conscience and other parts where you're very weak in your conscience. I know this is definitely for me. I know I'm very conservative in a lot of parts of my life that some of my friends aren't as conservative in. And I also know that I'm very free in a lot of areas of my life that a lot of my friends aren't free in. Things that I think are not sin, but some of my other friends think are sin. Things that I think are, that I shouldn't enjoy because I think they're sin, and then yet some of my friends don't think it's sin. And so I know that I'm a mix as well. I'm not just this strong guy or this weak guy. I'm, I'm a mixture of the two. And I couldn't even give you a percentage. I just know I'm a mixture. And that's not even the point, is to know am I more strong or more weak. It's just to know where you are. To know that this area, I feel like I'm pretty strong in this, but I, I, I'm realizing now I'm a little weak in this area, and I need to adjust myself so I can see other people's perspective. And the examples of this in our life, I mean, are myriad. I mean, there's so many different things that we can differ with each other and have very strong convictions and opinions on. I mean, think about just a, a, a quick list. Parenting. How many of you guys have a strong opinion on how you should parent your kids? Don't raise your hands. Alcohol. Uh, entertainment. What kind of movies are we allowed to watch? Can we only watch PG-13 or less? Or, you know, unless it's, and, and no rated R, unless it's Passion of the Christ, of course. You know, it, that's how we kind of think sometimes. 
And some, for some people, that's how they have a very strong opinion on those types of things. Or music, or other forms of entertainment. Video games, we have strong opinions, especially us older folks. <laughs> we have strong opinions on video games. Or how about diets? What you eat, what you shouldn't eat. Should you eat clean and organic? Should you, uh, free trade, you know, we want to support other uh, third world countries. And if you're not drinking free trade coffee, then you're somehow, you know, capitalizing on, the, you know, on, on poor people in other countries. And so we have these very strong opinions on things. And we think that if someone else doesn't see that same way, then somehow they're insensitive or they're sinful or they're selfish or self-centered. Or how about fashion? What's appropriate? What's inappropriate? We have different levels and opinions on what those things are. And those are very, very vast. And, and we'll sit there and think, well, clearly this is an appropriate kind of dress and this is totally okay. But then someone right next to you say, no, not only is this inappropriate, I agree with you, but even that is inappropriate. What are, you, are you kidding me? Right? And so, so we'll, we'll think that we're conservative and that you know, our friend is even more conservative. And you think that they're crazy. And so we have these different opinions and strong opinions about politics. Anyone here have a strong opinion on politics? And you cannot believe that your friend thinks this way or that way. You're liberal and you just think that your conservative friends are idiots. You're conservative. You can't understand how anyone can possibly think like a liberal. And we sit there and we dig our heels in the ground and we think that we are absolutely right. We have the more biblical view and those people are idiots. That is how we think. And when we cannot learn how to get along and live next to each other, then problems happen. Fights happen. Broken friendships happen. The witness of Christ is ruined when we're bickering with each other. How about money and spending habits? You look at your friend, you think they're frivolous with their money. You look at your other friend, you think that they're a miser. And, and, and yet we think that we have the perfect balance of our spending habits. And so we have all these different opinions, all these different convictions. We need to learn how to get along with each other. And so today that's what we're going to be looking at is how do we live among each other in peace with charity and grace towards each other, not compromising our own values and convictions, but learning how to live alongside other people, even in our own home, Christian or not, how do we live among them and be peacemakers? So let's pray and thank the Lord for uh, his grace towards us, and we're going to ask the Lord that he would help us give grace to others. Father in heaven, this life is just simply, it is, it is not easy. It's not simple. And, uh, and yet, even though it isn't simple, we even have a way of making it even more complicated than it has to be. We make things so complex and so difficult for ourselves and for others. Help us, Lord, as we go through your word, help us to have our hearts broken, softened, that our, our hearts would be filled and overflowing with graciousness, loving kindness, and peace without compromising our own convictions, our own beliefs and values, but how do we be peacemakers. How do we live among others who differ with us, sometimes differ with us greatly? We thank you, Lord, for your wisdom through your word. And Holy Spirit, we really need you this morning to lead us into this truth. Help us see our blind spots. Help us see our stubbornness, our strong opinions that border on the line of uh, sinfulness as we judge other people. Help us to hold strong to our thoughts and opinions, uh, but also be gracious towards others. May your word lead us into that truth today so that it would change our hearts. We thank you and we love you, and it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to be looking at quite a few different parts of Scripture today. We're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 8, and then we're going to go into chapter 10 uh, because uh, he kind of has uh, the similar thoughts in both chapters. So we're going to start in 1 Corinthians 8, chapter 9. And I'll probably comment through some of this stuff because there's a lot of Scripture, not just in the beginning here, but a little bit later on. Paul says this, take care that this right of yours, speaking to the strong, so the strong know they have a right that, that they can eat and enjoy all these things, and their conscience is not bothered by it. So he says, uh, take care that this right of yours doesn't somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge, so you have the knowledge that, that God has given this, it's a good gift, this meat is fine, you have that knowledge, but if someone who doesn't have that same knowledge, they see you eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to now eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, 
because this person now partakes and now he has sinned against God because he was convinced it was wrong and now he's doing it too. So because of that, this weak person is destroyed. The brother for whom Christ died, thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. So strong words for the person with the strong conscience. Don't let your strong conscience be an opportunity to make a weaker brother or sister stumble. We need to be very careful with our freedom that we have. So now jumping down to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. This is the Corinthians. Remember how the Corinthians, uh, Paul would sometimes quote their modern day uh, quotations. The, the Corinthians are saying, well, all things are lawful. We can do everything we want. And Paul says, eh, maybe, but not all things are helpful. Just because it's lawful doesn't mean it's helpful for your life. And he quotes them again, all things are lawful. He says, yeah, maybe, but not all things build up. Not all things that we can enjoy in our life actually encourage the people around us. So let no one seek his own good, but rather let him seek the good of his neighbor. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. I love that advice. He says, look, if you're not sure if, if this meat's offered to an idol, just don't ask. Just eat it, conscience, you know, free of guilt, right? Just enjoy it. Don't ask any questions. Just enjoy the meat. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Paul's saying, look, just enjoy the gifts of God because everything that is on this earth, God has made so we can enjoy these things. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you're disposed to go, so you feel the obligation, I should go to my friend's house, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. So he's saying, you go to a non-believer's house and they offer you this meat. You're not sure if it's been offered to an idol. He says, just don't ask, just eat the meat and you're clear. But if someone says to you, so another friend is with you, and they whisper in your ear, hey, this has been offered in sacrifice. So this person's got a weak conscience. He's with you. Clearly, this isn't talking about the person uh, that's giving this because their conscience is clear, but this guy, your friend, who has a weaker conscience says, hey, we shouldn't do this. So let's say, for instance, you go to a, a guest house, right, and, and they offer you a beer. And you're like, yeah, I can have a beer. But you're with someone who thinks that's wrong. And they whisper, say, hey, I don't think we should have this. You know, this, is, this would be bad, it'd be a bad witness. So what Paul's saying is that for the sake of their conscience, not yours, okay, then do not eat it, or in this case, don't drink it, for the sake of the one who informed you, the one who whispered in your ear, for the sake of conscience. I don't mean your conscience, but his. So he's saying for their sake, not so much for the, the person offering, because they're fine, clearly, they offered it to you, but for this person's sake, even if you know that you're clear in your conscience, where you go, you know, that, yeah, totally, it makes sense. Let's, let's, just, let's just ask for water or tea or whatever it is. And he says this. So this is kind of an interesting thing, he says, and it sort of seems like Paul is contradicting, but I think the context of this whole thing says something other than what seems clear here. Uh, I'll explain this here in a second. For why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, so if I drink this beer with thankfulness or this meat with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that for which I give thanks? So it sounds like Paul is saying the opposite of what he just said. He just now says, uh, for this guy's sake, don't, don't drink the beer, don't, don't have the meat. But then Paul says, why should my liberty be determined by this guy? Doesn't that seem like it contradicts? It's because it does. That's why I don't think that's what he means. I think what Paul means here is he's saying uh, hypothetically saying, uh, why should my liberty and what I know is okay be determined by this other person? So if I now drink this beer, or I have this meat, now all of a sudden this guy's condemning me. All right, this guy's looking down upon me. He's saying, if I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced? So I don't want my brother, my brother in Christ, to denounce me and now determine that my conscience is bad. So he's saying for the sake of this guy's conscience and for the sake of my freedom not being uh, called scandalous by my own brother who's weak in his conscience, I should just not partake. I don't want him to determine my conscience. So I'm just going to say, that's fine. So Paul's saying here, we should, for the sake of others, we should give this thing up in this moment. Now for the strong, we're obligated to look after those who are weak in their conscience. That's what Paul clearly says here. We saw last week that those who are weak of uh, some of them become legalistically oppressive or judgmental or manipulative. He's not necessarily speaking about those people. There's a difference between being weak in your conscience. You're genuinely weak. 
You're kind of uninformed on scripture or doctrine, and, and you personally are weak. There's a difference between that and now being judgmental and oppressive towards others and having them uh, live to your standards. So Paul's not talking about those people. He's talking about people who are genuinely weak brothers and sisters in their conscience. He says, you've got to look out for them. I'm not talking about the judgmental, pharisaical people. You've got to kind of challenge them and confront them. But the people who are genuinely weak in their faith, who are uninformed in their faith, Maybe they're young believers, just immature. Maybe they have some gnarly past that they can't seem to get over. You gotta look out for them. You gotta care for them. You know that God gives all good gifts, but you have to be looking out for them because they don't quite understand that. They're uninformed, they're a sensitive believer. So yes, you have rights that you're aware of and you enjoy. You know that nothing is unclean in itself, that God gives all good gifts to be enjoyed with thanksgiving. But if you're with someone who doesn't agree, who has a weak conscience, for their sake, you should abstain. Look out for them. Don't look out for you. If you're going to walk in love towards others, you have to be willing to lay aside your preferences. So maybe it's movies. You've got a friend, and you say, hey, do you want to watch this movie? And they're kind of embarrassed, a little sheepish. You say, I don't really want to watch that. I don't like violence or whatever it is. Or, and, and don't say, oh, it's fine. You know, oh, come on now. You know, how old are you? Just, just say, okay, cool. You want to pick something else? That's, I can, we'll watch whatever. Right? Don't, don't oppress them. Don't make fun of them. Don't guilt them. Don't put anything in their path that's going to potentially stumble them and give in to now peer pressure or whatever it is. And now they're sinning against God because they're doing something they don't think they should do. Don't be that person to them. Look out for them. Watch out for them. Uh, last uh, St. Patrick's Day. Uh, St. Patrick's Day is a high holy day in my household. Uh, it's like one of the, I mean, like top three holidays, you know. I hope you can guess which other two are more important. Um, but St. Patrick's Day, it's a, it's a big deal for our family. Uh, and on St. Patrick's Day, I, uh, having a pint of Guinness is like this family tradition. I mean, we, we love having a pint of Guinness on St. Patrick's Day. And on this particular day, though, I wanted to invite some friends of ours. Uh, and I know these folks don't drink. They're Mormon. And, uh, and I know they don't drink, and so I'm sitting there going, I want to have them over, I want to invite them to my house, uh, but I don't want to offend them. I don't want to put something in front of them, make them feel weird, make them feel guilty, or, or just or, or funny. And I don't want them to you know, judge my conscience, all those things. And so another friend of mine was going to be coming over, and, uh, and that's why I texted him, I said, hey, I really want to have this family over, because you know, we, we love this family, they're just a fantastic family. And, um, and I said, uh, but I don't, um, but because you know, they don't believe in drinking, uh, I don't, we're not going to have any Guinness tonight. I said, is that cool with you? And he said, oh, that's fine. I, and I told him I would rather have this family over than have Guinness on St. Patrick's Day. And that's, you know, this part of our, like, family, you know, like, we're Irish, and so, you know, we love having a Guinness on St. Patrick's Day. But being able to put that aside for the sake of others, being willing to do that for other people, even things that are maybe important to you, something that is, a, you know, a family tradition or whatever it might be, being able to put those things aside for the sake of other people that you love not wanting to stumble them or do anything that might offend them. It might be your own, in your own marriage. Maybe, guys, maybe you, you like, you know, certain movies, you know, or, or maybe some of your wives don't like when you have a, a beer at night or whatever it might be. And you have to think to yourself, would I rather have the comfort of, and, and the security that I want for my wife or would I rather have this freedom that I enjoy? And you have to make that choice. What is more important to you? What does walking in love look like for you? Wives, the same thing. You have your preferences of how things are done, how things look around the house or whatever it might be or what your husband's schedule looks like or how the kids are, and you have to decide what is more important to me. The love, the security of my, my husband, my family, or getting my way. And we have to decide what is more important to us. Romans 15, chapter, uh, chapter 15, verse 1 says, We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him up, for Christ did not please himself. And that's the key. We're going to come back to that a bit later. Christ did not please himself. He's our example in this. So to the weak, we looked at kind of some, some points for the strong to consider and how to put their preferences aside. But to the weak, there's advice as well from Paul for you. So I want to walk you through something that's, I think, very important, not just for the weak, but also for the strong, but something that's really important for us. This is in your notes. You can follow along here. It's the difference between preference and offense and stumbling. Sometimes we use these three things interchangeably, and we should not do this all the time. So in your notes, you can read here with me. It says, it's one thing to have your preferences ignored. 
right? And that usually offends us. We don't like when our preferences are ignored. It's another thing to be offended. All right, that's a different, that's like another level. But it's a whole different thing to be caused to stumble, which is yet even another level. Now, the issue that Paul is warning the strong against specifically here is that they should not stumble somebody. Though no doubt he also has a desire that we wouldn't offend people and we'd also put aside our preferences. But his main focus here is to not stumble someone. Now, to stumble someone is to purposefully put something in front of them to cause them to get tripped up. Now, the word in the Greek is scandalon. It's where we get our word scandal. So you don't want to scandalize someone, cause them to do something wrong, to scandalize them, putting something in front of them, you know, meat that's been offered to an idol or alcohol or a certain movie or certain music that might cause them to sin. You don't want to put that purposefully in front of someone, not caring on whether they're going to sin or not if they partake in that thing. That is to stumble someone when you're purposely, haphazardly, uncaring about how they're going to respond to it. You're just thinking about, well, I want to enjoy this right now. That's to cause someone to stumble, purposefully doing this. Now, sometimes someone has preferences, okay, and I'm kind of talking specifically to those with a weak conscience, maybe. So you have a preference or maybe a conviction, certain movies or music you can't listen to, certain things you can't enjoy, whatever it might be. You know, you don't want to dress a certain way, uh, your politics a certain way, whatever. You have uh, preferences and convictions. These are values that you have. They're legitimate values, and you've got these preferences. And maybe another person isn't willing uh, to, to let you have those preferences, and they're somehow uh, putting pressure against you to change your preference or to go along with their own preference. And sometimes this happens and it's just a preference. And so when you see someone else who has a stronger conscience or a different opinion, then you push in and now you're starting to call this thing that these people have their opinion on, you're calling it sin. And now you're calling foul. You're saying, hey, you're causing me to stumble. You know, I, this is how I view certain things and now you're causing me to stumble. And we might say that even though it's really just a preference that we have, but now we're actually saying you're causing me to sin. Now, the weak, this is somehow the weak person's way of, of kind of taking control and manipulate a little bit. Somehow try to strong arm someone into doing things their way. And in reality, this person's not actually about to sin. They really just have a strong preference. They're not actually getting stumbled, but they just don't like that they're not getting their preference. Offending, being offended and being stumbled are not always interchangeable. Okay, I'll, I'll give you an example. When I was back at Bible college, I had this roommate, we called him Legalistic Tom. And I'll tell you why, it's because he was legalistic and his name was Tom. And so, and we called him this to his face, it was really sad, but, but he was very legalistic. And, and so I had this, this little statue, okay, it's the Thinker by uh, Rodin, uh, the sculptor. Uh, and this little statue, it's a, it's, a, it's a nude guy sitting on a stool just going like this, you've probably seen him before, right? And this was on my dad's desk all throughout my childhood. Uh, he was an illustrator, worked at home, and he just had this little statuette uh, the, by Rodin of the thinker. And so my whole life, uh, growing up, I, just, I always just equated this little statue with my dad's workplace. So when I moved out of the house when I was 18, um, you know, I just I kind of went through his office and I said, Dad, can I have the thinker? I said, I want to just have it on my desk all throughout my years uh, or have it somewhere in my house so I can just always remember my childhood and remember uh, what it was, you know, just remember going into your office late at night, talking, whatever it is. This was kind of a picture of my childhood and my dad. And uh, so I had this, th this thinker at Bible college, and I just had it out on one of the shelves, whatever. And when I would uh, come home, I'd just find the thinker missing. And uh, I didn't know where the thinker was. And I just asked my roommates, where's it at? And, and legalistic Tom, he says, well, I, I hid it because it was causing me to stumble. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? And he goes, well, it was, it was causing me to stumble. And you're, if it caused me to stumble, then you have to put that away. And I said, well, so it's causing you to sin? And, and all of us, we were kind of having a powwow as a, as a group. There were six of us in this room. And, and he goes, well, no, it's not causing me to sin. It's just, I just think it's inappropriate. And I said, oh, okay, well, that's a little different. You think it's inappropriate or it's actually causing you to sin. So I said, well, here's what I'll do. I'll put it in my little cubby space that's kind of really out of view. It's just kind of in my little spot. And uh, the next day I come in and the thinker's missing again. And I'm looking around for the thinker, and I find him in my drawer, like hidden underneath clothes. I'm going, the thinker's in my drawer. Like, I hid this thing back so you can't even see it. But he kept saying, he's like, well, it's, 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 it's inappropriate, and so you need to put it away. And, and so now I'm looking at this, 
And I'm thinking to myself, and this is where the difference between being offended or thinking something's inappropriate or something's actually stumbling us, sometimes when we have a strong opinion on something, it's not actually causing us to sin, we just don't like it. And then now we put it on other people and we say, you're stumbling me, we're making them feel like they're sinning by enjoying something that they have a freedom to enjoy, and we're saying, you're causing me, you're sinning against me, and in reality, you just don't like it. Now, it's not that we should be okay with offending people. So what I did with the, with the thinker was put it in my cubby so it would be out of Tom's view. But that still wasn't enough for him. So in my view, as I look back upon this, uh, you know, if, if he had a strong preference for something, he could have either just not said anything. So, you know, I don't like that statue, but no big deal. Not my preference, but that's okay. Or if he was a little offended, if he really thought it was inappropriate, he can speak up. He can say, hey, do you mind if you just put that maybe in your cubby or something? Or just, you know, take it out at night, look at it and put it away or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what another suggestion would be. Um, and then if I didn't, if I said, oh, I'll just put it in the, the cubby and, and that's fine. And if he didn't quite like that, he's, he could have just moved along, uh, moved on with it. Uh, unless it was really causing him somehow to stumble, then I would definitely be absolutely obligated to just put the thing away. Uh, but I did what I thought was, you know, kind of the, the best thing where I'm kind of hiding it from his view and whatever. Uh, but he was a guy that was kind of looking for things, looking for traps that people were getting in and whatever. Another situation that I find myself in often uh, is uh, I'll have, you know, a lot, a lot of different friends that, you know, cuss, they curse, they use all kinds of different words. Uh, and, and it's always funny when I first meet someone and we talk and they're, you know, kind of jabbering on and whatever. And then eventually somehow they ask me what I do for a living. I say I'm a pastor and then like, oh man, the whole conversation changes. One time, a guy actually said, right when I said it, and he goes, he goes, oh, blank, I'm so sorry about my mouth. And, I'm going, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, and, and here's, here's the thing. I might prefer that they don't talk a certain way, but it doesn't offend me. It doesn't, it doesn't offend me. I don't prefer it, but I'm not gonna sit there and insist on my preference. It doesn't offend me. And it surely doesn't cause me to stumble. I, used to, I had a really foul mouth before I became a believer, but even hearing people curse, it doesn't, it doesn't offend me, and it also doesn't cause me to stumble. So I just let people talk how they do. And a lot of times, I was actually just talking to a guy uh, yesterday, uh, and I had this exact conversation uh, yesterday. And I'm talking with this guy. He's a clerk at a liquor store, and, and it sounds like I drink a lot, huh? I'm like talking about Guinness and going to liquor stores. <laughs> uh, I, was, I was going in for a soda. And... Uh, <laughs> and uh, this guy, we, just, we actually talked for about an hour in this liquor store. He's uh, from Iraq, and we were just talking, talking about his homeland and all kinds of stuff. And, uh, and once he found out as a pastor, he, he just, his whole tone changed. And I said, listen, it's fine. You, you just do you, I'll do me. And that's it, and we're good. And he was like, are you sure? I said, I'm totally fine. I put my big boy ears on this morning when I walked out the door. I'm okay. And, uh, and so I might not prefer certain things, but I'm fine with it. I'm not offended. And even if I'm offended sometimes, sometimes people do say offensive things. I've had plenty of times when, when they hear I'm a pastor or whatever, they say things that are very offensive about God. They, they really try to rattle me. It's like they're trying to shake me, trying to get me flustered. And it even offends me, but I still just say, hey, you know, I get it. I understand why you think the way you do. It's totally fine. I just want to have a good conversation with you. And that usually shocks them because I'm not sitting there trying to impose things because even though I'm offended but I'm not being stumbled. I'm not starting to question my faith that they're saying things about God or whatever. I'm not offended by it. I'm, I might be offended by it, but I'm not being stumbled by it. And so it's important to know these distinctions. Now, for the strong, it's not okay to uh, insist on your preference or, oh, I'm, I'm only offending them. I'm not stumbling them, so it's okay. I'm not saying that at all. You should aim not to even offend people. Aim not to even insist on your preference, but definitely do everything you can to not stumble people. Okay, and so now for you who are weak, if you're being stumbled, then yes, speak up or leave the situation. Get out of whatever that situation is if you feel like you're being led into sin by your own spouse, by your friends, by a group of friends, whatever it might be. You're watching a movie, get up and leave. Whatever it might be, leave if you feel like you're about to sin. If you're just being offended, I'm not, I don't mean like just as if it's not, not a big deal, but if you're being offended, pray and, and say, God, I want to endure this offense. I don't want to push this back on someone and insist on now my way. But sometimes you hear some stuff that's pretty dang offensive and you, you might just need to leave because it's really hard for you to hear. But if you're just being offended, try to endure through it. Try to, to be that, that light in that person's life, whatever it is that's going on. 
And if it's just simply preference, my opinion is just try to move on through it and just say, you know what, it's not my preference, but it's fine. It's not a big deal. I can move on. And I know that these things, these examples of, you know, the thinker or, uh, you know, something like someone cursing, these are small instances in our life. I know there's much bigger issues in our lives. And I know that even when it's just someone who loves you dearly and they're not putting aside their preference for you, I know that hurts. I know it's not a small thing to have your uh, preference be shunned by someone that loves you and that you love. I know that's not a small thing. So I'm not trying to minimize those things. What I'm saying is that as, as people, whether we're weak or strong in our conscience, we really ought to try to pray and just say, God, help me through this. I don't want to judge this person I, that I love. I don't want to insist on my preference. This is hard for me. But I need to learn, even if I, maybe I'm the one with the weak conscience, maybe they are, are too uh, strong or, or even too liberal, whatever it might be, but we just say, God, help me through this. I want to give them deference. I want to give them the love that, that I know that you gave me. And so we ask the Lord to really help us through this and being careful not to impose uh, our preferences, our values, our, uh, the things that we want on others that might see things differently. And so for the weak, you might be more apt to bring judgment or condemnation on someone, um, but you can't use your preference or your conscience and try to lord it over other people. Now, we've got to also recognize that we might have strong convictions and opinions, but we have to be able to let those things go. We have to be able to, to be free with those things and say, I'm going to hold on to them for myself, but I'm not going to impose these things on other people. But again, if someone is actually trying to stumble you or is stumbling you, you need to either speak up or you need to get out of that situation. Somehow you've got to just remove yourself from that. You know, but if it's not a stumbling type situation, just ask the Lord, Lord, give me a thick skin and a soft heart. Help me. Help me to lay my life down for these people that I disagree with. My spouse, my kids, my friends, people in my community group, whatever it might be, help me to lay my life down for them. You know, and, and in our life, you know, there's always going to be times where people are even going to make fun of us for our own convictions. You know, or somehow pick at them or try to disprove us and argue with us. And we have, if we believe that what we believe is right, we can hold on to those things tightly, but we also have to be able to give grace to other people who differ from us. Now, for both of us, the, the weak and the strong, one thing we can always do and need to do is realizing that our perspective, my perspective has been shaped by my upbringing, all the things we talked about last week, my upbringing, uh, the culture I live in, I might have valid views based on how I was brought up or how I've been taught or how I've studied the word or which sermons I've listened to over the years, but I also have to recognize that someone that opposes how I see things might also have some valid views. And we might actually have some uh, complementary views that we just don't see the side of each other. I don't understand why you see things the way you do. Maybe I'm not seeing something or maybe I don't understand the context you grew up in. So I'm sitting there going, I don't know why you think that this is wrong or that's wrong. And so I'm sitting there going, this seems so clear to me, and I don't know why that makes any sense to you. I've got to be able to recognize that I can maybe only see one aspect, one side of something. I've got this uh, graphic we can show here that maybe help out a little bit. This is a, a cylinder, right? It's round, but, but squared off on one side. From one angle, your conscience, the shadow, you just see a square. And you go, hey, this is it. Can't eat food offered in idol's temple. But then your friend, they see this, they look at the same exact issue and they see a circle. Well, well who's, who's right? Sometimes you're both right. It might be a different angle. So for instance, if I'm sitting there going, I'm able to eat uh, the meat from an idol's temple, but I don't understand that this other person grew up worshiping idols. And so for them to eat this, it's gonna cause them to stumble. I don't see that, that circular part of their life. And I can sit there and I can judge them all day long going, I don't understand why they see things the way they do. Or think about politics. Think about any of those things I mentioned in the beginning. We have such strong, we're convinced it's a square. Clearly this is a square. Spending habits, a square. Fashion and modesty, it's a square. But you might not understand someone else's context, how they grew up, how they thought, or, or whatever it might be. And they see something totally different. And we have to be willing to understand that maybe we don't see the whole picture. We're convinced it's a square, but we have to be mindful of the fact that we might not understand completely 
either whether it's theological or it's the other person's experience or whatever it might be, we have to be willing to appreciate that there might be both, a square and a, a circle, the cylinder. And ideally, we're able to square up with that cylinder and get that, that angle where we can actually see both sides. And I think that's the most ideal place we can be is having Scripture inform us so that we can see both sides of the equation, so we can be more objective. We might still lean on one side. We prefer this side, but at least we can understand and see the other side. And that's the ideal for us, is to be able to have that, that information, that transformation of our heart where we can be gracious towards other people who differ from us. Now, going into Romans chapter 14, this is going to be a, a bit of scripture here. Uh, Paul gives to the Roman church uh, a lot of insight into this very topic. He says, as for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him. Make him feel at home. Welcome him into your life but not to quarrel over opinions. Don't welcome into your life so you can start a fight. Don't invite your friend over so you can prove yourself to be right. Welcome him into your life, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he can eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. So those who are strong, don't look down upon the one who abstains. Okay, the one with uh, uh, liberal politics, don't look down on your conservative friends. Conservatives, don't look down on your liberal friends. Uh, whether it's schooling or education, fashion, whatever, don't look down on people who differ from you. Welcome them into your life. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. So those with a weak conscience, don't judge the person who has a strong conscience because God has welcomed him. God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? This is God's servant, not yours. This person doesn't answer to you. They answer to God. It's before his own master, speaking of God, that he stands or falls. And he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand, even if his opinion differs from you. One person esteems one day is better than the other, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind the one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. We make our decisions, hopefully, for the goal of honoring God, whether you eat or whether you don't eat. None of us lives to ourselves. We don't answer to ourselves, And none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the living and, and the dead. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? Why do you despise people who have differing opinions from you? We will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it's written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue will confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and I'm persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. So those with the weak conscience, take note. Nothing is unclean in itself. We can use things and abuse things sinfully, but nothing is unclean in itself. But it's unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. So those with a strong conscience, take note. You might think that something is okay, and it is okay, but if your brother or sister thinks it is unclean, you can't oppress their conscience. You should not put a stumbling block before them. If you have a good relationship with them, you guys can have good, healthy conversations, but you can't force them to see how you see. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you're no longer walking in love. For what you eat, do not destroy, uh, or by what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. Don't let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil, which is what I think was Paul was saying similarly to the Corinthians that I was trying to explain earlier. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Paul's saying, don't make the things that you have freedom in so important to you that you're willing to hurt other people so that you can enjoy them. Don't esteem these things and your freedoms as so important that you have to spout them off and flaunt your freedoms in a way that offends other people. The kingdom of God, he says, is not about these freedoms. It's not about eating and drinking. These aren't important matters in the grand scheme of things. So don't make a big deal out of your freedoms. Be able to put these things aside because the kingdom of God is about righteousness and peace and joy. 
And if you're robbing someone else's peace and joy because you're insisting on your freedom and your preferences, now you're not walking in love. And so we need to be able to put these things aside for the sake of others. And further, he goes on to say this in verse 18, whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Don't for the sake of food, for the sake of your freedoms, don't destroy the work of God in someone else's life. Everything is indeed clean. So for the strong, you're correct. Everything indeed is clean, but it's wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It's good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. For whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats because the eating is not from faith. So again, if you think that this clean thing is actually unclean and you eat, you're not eating in faith, but in doubt, then you're sinning because whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. We who are strong have an obligation, I read this earlier, to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up, for Christ did not please himself. We consider Christ. We consider Christ. Think about Jesus as someone who clearly had a very strong conscience, right? He had a perfect conscience. The only conscience ever to walk this planet that knew and understood and obeyed the perfect will of God. He had a strong conscience. He would have been so offended. He was so offended by what he saw on this earth, was he not? And picture this. God Almighty becomes a human being. And by the time he's probably four or five or six, he's starting to see sin around him and recognize it as for what it is. Offense against his father. He's offended. His whole childhood, he's looking around at his, his childhood friends going, he's offended by the way they act. He becomes an adult. He's offended by what he sees and how we're acting, his own people, the Jewish people, God's people, the way they are just ignoring their creator, their maker, he is offended his whole entire life, more than you can ever understand. You think you've been offended by your friends? You think your spouse has offended you when they've ignored your preferences? Your Lord has been more offended than you can possibly imagine. And yet he graciously, patiently, lovingly endured with us. He did not leave us, nor did he forsake us. He didn't say, Father, can I come home early because I can't do this? No, he was so offended everywhere he looked. But he endured with loving kindness and patience and faithfulness, self-sacrificing faithfulness, putting aside his preferences, putting aside his opinions, and not condoning our sin, but he says, I'm going to be patient with you. I'm going to strive with you because I love you. And so he does this his whole entire life. He's being offended by everyone, even betrayed. But he does this because of his love for us. He does not insist on his own way, but rather he washes our feet. He lays his life down. He becomes a servant to us. And he even dies on a cross for us, despite the way we have deeply offended him. He is grieved by what he sees and what he hears. He has major preferences on how he sees people living, but yet he patiently endures. So church, we should expect to be offended in our life from both believers, believers who love us, that we love, and non-believers. We should expect to be offended offended. Our Lord was offended. And we're not greater than our master, are we? So if he was offended and he injured, then we too also, we can be offended and injured because we know that we offend people and we've also offended God. And God has injured with us. And so we look to him to be our example. And so because our Lord injured our own offense, then didn't please himself, as Paul said, to the person with the weak conscience, he sets an example for you that out of love you can set aside your preference. And you might not see your preference as legalistic or whatever, and that's okay. That's, but you can set aside your preference and not impose it on other people because your Lord sets that example. And because our Lord endured our own offense and didn't please himself for the person with a strong conscience, he sets you an example as well. You can set aside your rights for the sake of others. 
because that's what he did. Your Lord had many rights, being God. Many, many rights. And he did not insist upon those rights. Instead, he became lowly and became a servant. Proverbs 19, 11 says, good sense makes one slow to anger and it is his glory, the person's glory, to overlook an offense. It's a good thing, church, to be able to look over offenses. I wanna pray now. And I wanna ask the Lord to, to help us. And I know that sometimes a sermon like this, I'm gonna be honest, I was frustrated forming this sermon this week because I feel like I turned over a bunch of rocks and I didn't get to explain everything. I don't get to put everything kind of back neatly in its place. And sometimes sermons like these bring up more questions than they do answers. And I can almost read some of your minds going, okay, but what about this? But what about this? But what about this? What about this? I, I can't answer all these. I can't answer it in one sermon. But this is something I hope that we can kind of just uh, awaken in our hearts, kind of jostle some things down, blow some dust off of some parts of our mind, that we can start thinking through deeply how we treat other people, how we react to when people offend us, and what's the difference between offense and preference and stumbling and for the, the strong saying, I, I definitely don't want to stumble people, but I don't want to also offend people or insist on my preference. And for the weak, it's saying, okay, how, how am I saying someone's stumbling me, but they're actually not? I just don't like what they're doing. You know, how can we change the way that we, we respond to these situations? I know there's so many different situations in our life, and so I'm just going to pray that the Lord would just help us sift through this. That you have really great conversations with your spouse, with your friends, in your community group. And just, just know, church, you've you got to be patient with yourself and patient with other people. And again, think about your Lord who patiently endured 33 years in this life overlooking offenses so that he could die for all those offenses. And so even for you, just know that you've got to be patient with your own self, patient with your legalism, patient with your sinfulness, patient with other people's preferences. you just got to be patient press in and just say, God, God, help me. Here's my conscience on the altar. Help me see clearly. Help me see. I'm seeing a circle. Help me see a square. So we need to ask the Lord just to, to help us because when the goal in our relationships is to win an argument, then no one actually wins, right? If you go into these conversations just to win and help someone see your side, then, then no one actually wins. We need to go in and, and, and be learners and seek to understand and see the other side. So let's pray and thank the Lord for his patience and grace towards us, that he patiently endures with us, and let's ask him to help us to patiently endure with one another. And in the meantime, hopefully help us grow and see uh, more objectively in our life. Father in heaven, we come to you and we're thankful, we're humbled, we're... Uh, maybe even a bit frustrated, confused. But uh, I, I know, Lord, that when I'm in that place, that's when I really wrestle with you, and I wrestle with your word, and I wrestle hopefully in a good way with other people, asking questions, pressing into conversation, being challenged in my thoughts and opinions and convictions. And usually what I find is either my conviction is more strengthened, which I always appreciate, or maybe my conviction has shifted a little bit because I've seen how I'm off a little bit. But either way, God, I'm, I'm praying that we would build each other up, that we would invite both the weak and strong into our lives, not to quarrel over opinions like Paul uh, says not to, but to hopefully help see a, a more objective view, a biblical view at some of these issues that divide us. And there are a number of things that divide us. And so many of those things we think are so obvious that it's clearly this way. But Lord, we, we must not think in that way. Help us to be gracious towards others. Help us to be patient towards others and to ourselves. And Lord, your word tells us that whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we want to do it to the glory of God. So for the one who is strong, let them enjoy to, the, to your glory. For the one who is weak, let them abstain to your glory. We're not to give offense to anyone or stumble anyone. We live our life as a living sacrifice to you primarily, but also to the world around us. So we thank you, Lord. We love you, and it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.